this month's uh, PJLA webinar. Um, as you can see, this month's topic is uh, 17025 common, common Findings on Assessments. Um, and of course, this is PJLA Assessments. Uh, and uh, we've compiled some data on this and um, uh, from our actual assessments. And uh, we're going to look at some numbers and look at some examples of nonconformances. We're going to look at the oh, uh, data between differences between testing and calibration. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Um, as always, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, those of you that are regular, um, you hear me go through this every every month uh, that uh, um, if you but, uh, for the benefit of you those that uh, may be new um, on our website uh, under uh, under uh, webinars we have a um, area for past webinars and uh, so actually looking at it yesterday they go back to 2002 and there's a vast array of topics that we cover so um, if uh, you want to go back and revisit this one or, or revisit the, any of the other ones that we did over the last couple of years. Uh, they, are, they are recorded and uh, are available um, on our website. So uh, now it's Friday. I'm going to delve right into this. Uh, um, what I have here on the screen, and this is for calibration. And as you can see on the left-hand side uh, is the elements of 17025. Along with PJLA's policy and simple procedure um, uh, requirements. So when our assessment team uh, come, goes on site and do, do an assessment, of course, it's for compliance within 17025. And it's also our policy, guys, PL123 for simple procedure SOP3. Um, I've done several webinars on our policy guides. Uh, and um, as you know, uh, if you've attended any of those, our policy guides are primarily uh, trickles down from ILAC. ILAC is basically the folks that accredit us. Um, um, and um, our policy guides aren't um, extra things that uh, we are putting out there beyond 17025. These are actually policies that our, we could refer to them as our accrediting body, uh, needs to see us address um, amongst our accredited laboratories. So again, this is for calibration. Uh, it's just it's just in uh, numerical order as you can see. We're going to basically we're going to take uh, we're not going to go through each and every um, element here. We're going to look at the uh, most common occurrences between testing and calibration. So uh, if, I'll leave that up there for a second. Uh, if you're having a uh, particular um, section that um, you're having trouble getting a grasp on, you can see how you line up with everyone else. See along the top, uh, PJLA, we're, we're, we're worldwide. We have uh, assessors around the world. So, of course, uh, we're prevalent here in the U.S. But this uh, data is also um, made up uh, from our assessments that we don't, we have done in Mexico, Japan, the Middle East, and India. Excuse me, not India, Italy, sorry. All right, so... Um, Moving on, uh, so right here for calibration, what I've done is I've listed the 10 most uh, common areas that we're finding findings. Um, as you see, top of the list is um, section 5.4, which is uh, test methods and method validation, excuse me, testing calibration methods. Uh, one thing that's interesting in here is we have captured in calibration, we have captured uh, PL123 and SOP3. Okay, this is the same data. And I um, uh, failed to mention uh, during the calibration at the top there. This is for um, assessments that uh, cover a one year period. And you see the time frame up top. It's um, November 1st, uh, 2015 through October 31st. 2016. This is information uh, we passed on to, to our assessors at uh, our annual conclave we have at the end of the year. So this is the um, latest compiled data that, that I have uh, covering a year's period. So this is the same uh, picture of uh, that I showed you with calibration. However, these are the testing labs. So again, if you're a testing lab, uh, there's uh, areas that uh, 
you might be struggling with, uh, you can uh, see where you, you line up. And like we did a task uh, calibration here shortly, we'll look at the top 10 for testing. And then we're going to run a side by side comparison. I'll leave up that there for, I'll leave that up there for a second. And have you all look at those, those numbers. And again, these are from uh, US, Mexico, Japan, Middle East, and Italy. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention with uh, testing is uh, testing also incl includes, uh, our, of course, our 17025, uh, ELAP, uh, um, uh, NAPAP, EPA, and reference material producers. So that's, uh, that's included in this as well. Okay, now we have... Uh, and uh, we, same data that we had for calibration. However, for testing, uh, this is the top 10. Uh, one thing that stands out, and you'll see the side-by-side -side comparison here, that uh, I don't see any of the PL123 here. And that's understandable if you consider uh, uh, not so much PL1, but uh, what PL2, which is traceability, and PL3 is uncertainty. How uh, That could be much more prevalent for calibration organizations. All right, here we are with a side-by-side -side comparison. So leave that up there for a moment. Um, you can see there's a, quite a few common elements between both testing and calibration. Um, uh, like I said, the one thing that stands out is uh, testing um, top 10 lists. I'll just call them the top 10 lists for, for both, both sides there that um, the PJLA policies and procedures do not appear on the testing side. All right, so what I'm going to do, um, look, I'm going to capture each of those elements that we just saw on the top 10 list for both calibration and testing. Um, basically, list a, a finding that, that may occur and uh, have some discussion points um, in each of these areas. So I'm going to start out with the, the area. And if you notice, let me just back up one space here. 5.4, that is at the top of the list for, for both labs, testing and calibration. So uh, 5.4, of course, is whatever at the top of the screen here. That is a section in 17025 that addresses uh, testing and calibration methods and method validation. And this was at the top of the list for both calibration and testing. So uh, a common finding, and this one here is much more prevalent for calibration labs, but it is an area that uh, particularly new labs have an area uh, that we find struggling with, is uh, measurement uncertainty. So uh, the requirement I'm referring to here is 5461. A calibration lab and also a testing lab performing its own calibration shall have and apply a procedure to estimate the uncertainty of measurements for all calibrations and types of calibrations. Hence, uh, pretty straightforward there. Um, you have that word shall. So uh, I've heard my uh, presentation on internal audits. Uh, a shall is a requirement. A should is a recommendation. So, so uh, an example of a finding. And actually, I've changed some names to protect the innocent on here. I've captured some things on uh, some assessments that I've personally been on. So uh, this particular one stays within a... Uh, QAP, Quality Assurance Procedure, Section 4.6, Estimation of Uncertainty is addressed. This section refers to specific elements. No actual elements, internal or external procedure for determining uncertainty along with applying them to actually calibration produced during an assessment. So the, uh, the objective evidence that was actually looked at during there was the fact that in an organization, if you're performing a calibration or uh, you have that um, we, we, as you know, if you've uh, been subjected to um, our assessments, we, we, uh, we go out there and watch what you folks do, Beth, and that is perform the testing and calibration under your scopes of accreditation. So typically, if I'm watching a technician perform a calibration, I want to uh, follow it through, which also includes uh, 
um, applying that procedure to the calibration that was undertaken. So, um, I'll leave that up there for a second. And we're going to talk, expand on uncertainty some more. We also write them up under PL, excuse me, PL3. And uh, we're going to uh, go into a little bit more detail with uncertainties and some common findings that we have in regards to those. It's not just uh, an area for, for calibration. There are requirements in 17025 and PL3. We do, uh, there are requirements for testing labs. So it is, uh, <coughs> could be quite likely that the <coughs> testing lab uh, may have a nonconformance in this area as well. Uh, certainly has to be addressed in testing. <coughs> Okay, so uh, expand it just a little further into Section 5.4. So with Section 5.4, um, we're also looking at suitable methods. We're looking at uh, we're looking at lab development methods. Um, if you're following a national nationally recognized or internationally recognized procedure, that you're following those. Um, if you're not, if you're deviating from them, that that would come under. Uh, um, an area that would need to be validation. So these would be all be areas that uh, um, under 5.4 that potential non-conformances could be written under. Uh, last but uh, at the end of uh, uh, section 5.4, we look at uh, data control. So uh, um, 5.4.7.2, and I, I come across this on some of my assessments, and there's a little bit of confusion with this, I, I find. Um, this has got to do with... Um, software ver uh, validation. So uh, the requirement states when computers or automatic equipment are used for the acquisition, processing, recording, reporting, storage, and retrieval of test and or calibration data, the laboratory shall ensure that computer software developed by the user is documented in sufficient detail and is suitably validated as being adequate for use. Um, this particular um, um, finding was written uh, in regards to an internally written spreadsheet used in testing or not suitably validated. The objective evidence was a spreadsheet that was actually seen in purity testing, which looks up values and calculates percentages, has no record of being validated. Hence, um, Excel, let's say, for example, Excel. Excel itself does not need to be validated. Um, if you are actually modifying, if you're taking an Excel and you're writing your own formulas and the, the spreadsheet is doing calculations and looking up values, then you need to validate it. If you're using third-party software, there's a note within 17025 that states that's suitably validated. But if you're using, and I'm just throwing Excel out there, and um, you're using it and you're writing your own spreadsheets, then... Um, as an assessor, if I see that, I would ask to see the, um, the validation of that. And I've come across that in several occasions. Um, one thing I failed to mention again at the beginning was at the end, for those of you that are new here, that we had an opportunity to submit questions. And uh, at the end of here, I'll, um, at the end of the uh, presentation, I will uh, go into more detail and, and um, let you know how that's accomplished. Okay, uh, an area that was up the top of the list is Section 510, which is reporting the results. As you can see, that was number two in calibration, number five in testing. So I always, when I explain, uh, typically go over Section 5, uh, 510 is the very last thing. That's the end product. That's what you're producing. That's the report of test, calibration certificate. Uh, you have the personnel, the facilities, um, the traceability. Um, um, all in place, that's all been valid, that all been uh, um, assessed, and we get to the end here, we're going to look at your final product, which is the, uh, um, the test or calibration report that's being produced. So Section 510, there's quite a few shells in there, and that's one area that uh, the standard breaks down um, in, in, uh, in a couple places between testing and calibration. There's an area within 510 that's uh, for both, testing and calibration. Then it will break down, it will go into for testing organizations, then we'll break down for calibration organizations. It'll break down even further and specify if you're doing sampling. So um, there's a, uh, say, a, uh, a long um, 
laundry list of items under 510, and then the word shall appears there. So this particular example is um, under 510-2C, um, unique identification of the test or calibration certificate, such as a serial number, and on each page an identification in order to ensure that the page is recognized as a part of the test or calibration certificate and a clear indication at the end of the test or calibration certificate. And I bolded that last section because this particular nonconformance uh, was written in regards for that requirement not being met. Hence, um, uh, calibration reports, issues do not indicate the end of the report. The two-page report indicates page one on each page. Um, and the objective evidence that I looked at I, is actually a certificate. So when you're uh, um, doing your internal audits, you want to actually go out and pull certificates that you wrote under your scope of accreditation and um, review them against the requirements of 510 when you're doing your um, internal audits. Uh, well, there, there's uh, quite a few things there. Um, if you're um, such as uh, um, goes into uh, the person who releases the report, quite often it specifies in the standard the name and function. Um, so uh, um, written some uh, nonconformance because the function was not identified. This is the person that actually releases the report. In smaller organizations, that could be the same individual that did the, the uh, particular test or calibration. However, that, that function needs to be listed. Uh, other things are, of course, the units of measure. Uh, goes into uh, also that, that uncertainty. Uh, for, more, for calibration, the uncertainty and or a statement of compliance. And that's an area that uh, um, we define even further and um, as, uh, excuse me, give guidance in PL3 as far as uh, uh, what's needed if you do not uh, report uncertainty on a calibration certificate. So um, 510, as you see, that was at the top of the list fairly in both calibration and testing. Um, also, uh, um, covered under 510 and, uh, is um, if you have to reproduce a report. Uh, let's say you did a test or calibration, you produced the report. Uh, and if I'm the assessor, uh, often I'll just ask the question, if you had to uh, reproduce a report, uh, um, how would you do it? Um, two parts of the equation is um, each report or test has to have a unique uh, identifier. Um, you have to give it a, uh, you have to give it another um, unique identifier, and you have to um, replace the report that it's um, um, replacing. So, in other words, a uh, unique identifier, and it needs to reference the original report. So, uh, moving on. All right. Uh, Section 5.5 is equipment, um, and it's on uh, both testing and calibration. So um, typically with equipment, we're looking at uh, you have to have basically the equipment to do the job. Um, it has to be calibrated before being put into service. You have to maintain equipment records. Any equipment that's uh, uh, been determined to be not operating correctly has to be la uh, labeled and segregated as to not allow uh, um, use of that particular equipment. Uh, here's a um, um, example of a nonconformance written in regards to section 5.5.1. The laboratory shall be furnished with all items of sampling, measurement, and test equipment required for the correct performance of the testing or calibration, including sample preparation of the test and or calibration items processed and analyzed of the test and or calibration data. Uh, this comes right out of uh, one of my findings uh, current, and this is for a new assessment. This says proposed scope. Uh, current proposed scope is requesting capabilities of calibrating floor and crane scales up to 10,000 pounds, I should be pounds there, using NIST Handbook 44 methods. To accomplish this, the lab would need 12.5% or 1,250 pounds of traceable test weights. Lab has more than enough test weights to do the work, however, only has 800 pounds, which would be considered traceable and recently calibrated by the state of Ohio. And of course, the objective evidence would be the calibration report that was looked at, which actually showed the uh, um, traceable 
test weights that this uh, laboratory or scale company probably was um, had on site. And uh, of course, in this particular instance, they didn't have the traceable standards to do the job, which was they wanted to be able to go up to 10,000 pounds. Um, hence, a nonconformance was written. Okay, um, top of the list in both testing and, excuse me, calibration and testing is section uh, section 5-6, which is, which is measurement traceability. So a little de depiction at the bottom there is uh, talking about traceability. That is traceability to the SI through NIST. Uh, that, um, again, we have a policy guide um, in regards to traceability. I believe we're going to touch on that here in a little bit in the examples of nonconformances that was written against the policy guide. So in this particular one, a, a, a um, common nonconformance under 561 is all equipment. That's all equipment used for test or calibration, including equipment for subsidiary mem uh, measurements, such as uh, environmental conditions, having a significant offense effect on the accuracy or validity of the result of the test, calibration, or sampling shall be calibrated before being placed in the service. Laboratories shall have an established program and procedure for the calibration of its equipment. So in this particular um, nonconformance, a finding was written because environmentals captured during the calibration does not have an accompanying report showing its calibration status. And the objective evidence that was looked at was an actual thermometer used to capture water temperature while witnessing the calibration of a pipette. Now, those folks have, uh, that are in the calibration in many particular pipettes, you would know that uh, that's a significant uh, piece of equipment uh, standard that's used in the calibration of pipettes because you're correcting for temperature and you're also converting mass to a volume and the temperature of the water is um, captured during and utilized in that calculation. So it's just not uh, oh, your physical standard, your equipment. It's also, bear in mind, any anything that you're using to capture your environmentals. If it's going on the report, if you're capturing, putting the environmentals on the report, chances are it needs to be calibrated and it needs to be a traceable calibration. <clears throat> Okay, moving on, uh, this here is uh, section 4.3, which is document control. And uh, this is both uh, on the top of the, the list, uh, top 10 list for both calibration and testing. Um, document control basically uh, is the procedure that's in place. Uh, documents are things that tell you how to do something, as opposed to records which show you what's been done. So. Documents could be a blank form. Once you write on it, it becomes a record. Documents, of course, is your internal procedures. I have your quality manual, for example, as a, a, a internal document that you have. What we find uh, uh, um, often in writing nonconformances for document control would be the uh, control of external documents. And this is typically captured in uh, 4321. A master list or an equivalent docu document control procedure identifying the current revision status and distribution of documents in the management system shall be established and shall be readily available to uh, preclude the use of invalid and or obsolete documents. Um, pretty easy for your internal documents. Let's say you have a, uh, let's take your quality manual, you might be on revision two. You, you uh, revise your quality manual, you'll now go up to revision four, uh, you would um, archive your old, and you would uh, update your master documents list, if that's how you're capturing this, to specify um, uh, revision four. External documents, now these are things that are brought from the outside world in. So if you are accredited through Perry Johnson Laboratory accreditation, I know right off the bat that um, external documents are going to include PL1234 and SOP3. So um, I would be looking for these external documents to be addressed 
in document control, and particularly if you are utilizing this master list. Um, could be other things, your procedure. Let's uh, say you're using an ASTM USP uh, procedure that, that you are basing your testing calibration. They're subjected to revision. Uh, they need to be controlled as well. Uh, recently did an assessment looking at the scope and uh, um, looked at, I believe it was an um, um, ASM procedure, looked at the year and uh, I uh, did a little research and on the internet and found that was not the latest and the greatest, hence a nonconformist was written. Uh, it's the organization's uh, responsibility to assure that they uh, they are um, operating off the latest and greatest document. And the problems, uh, not conformances that uh, we see in this is more related to the external documents. I know at PJLA, when we revise things uh, for our, our labs, uh, we send out notification. We update them on our website. So uh, it's up to the organization to actually update their master list, include these things on their master. So the uh, specific objective evidence that was looked at was this particular laboratory's uh, uh, SOP manual table of contests, which they pre presented, which was their master list that did not include external documents. Okay, uh, PL1. This is the first time one of our policy guys up here. And this is on proficiency testing. And for calibration, it was in the top of the list at numbers, top 10 list at number six. For testing, it didn't make the top 10. However, there was 58 total nine conformances written. So proficiency testing, PL1. Uh, this is an area, especially with initial accreditation. And I would state uh, probably the two areas that come to mind for, for new labs that uh, might struggle is maybe getting proficiency tests on there under control and then also measurement uncertainty and uncertainty budgets in that whole realm for new calibration labs are, are two areas that we find a lot of new labs struggle with. Um, I would say a lot, but if there is a struggle, it's probably going to be in uh, one of those two areas. So uh, PL, I was, we're just going to go through uh, one example of a non-conformance written here and then uh, touch on some other areas that, uh, that uh, I've seen uh, area problems and written and nine conformances on. So PL1 under 62 and actually when we revised uh, PL1 a couple years ago, this was written into it. The following activity listed in their order of preference may only be used pending prior approval by PJLA. Includes intralab comparisons and repeatability studies. Right under that requirements is a note. It is an organization wishes to proceed with one of the above means they must state in writing why third party or interlab comparisons are not feasible and how they plan to conduct the test and or analyze the data. This document must be submitted to PJLA headquarters for review and approval. So uh, we um, had to um, write this into our PL1 policy guys. So we've had labs that were doing intralab comparisons. Um, due to this requirement, uh, if uh, there was a third party available, um, they were being basically um, being uh, required to use that third party or else conduct an intralab test. So uh, um, we've gone a couple of years now with this. We're not uh, hopefully got uh, got uh, everybody uh, that's been accredited with us for a while uh, an understanding of this requirement. So a statement of this particular finding is simply a 2016 proficiency test was conducted via repeatability. I'll let you do the reading there, but uh, basically the gist of this is that the uh, proficiency test was uh, conducted using repeatability um, and the uh, approval was not granted. So this particular lab continued to use uh, a method which um, we would not allow without, uh, without being approved. And um, the objective evidence was the actual proficiency test that was uh, uh, submitted for that assessment. Um, so other, uh, other areas of proficiency tests with new labs, uh, basically before you're even accredited, you have to get a, you have to do an approved proficiency test within the realms of PL1. Uh, again, we go over approved methods of proficiency testing. Um, we we uh, allow interlab. So that's if uh, 
two or more accredited organizations would calibrate or test the same artifact or sample and um, compare. The, and this is the the part that uh, that um, um, like to emphasize and and compare the results in a meaningful way. So in other words, um, if you're doing a uh, interlab proficiency test with another organization, well, I want it we required to see more than here's their results, here's our results. We need to see some sort of analysis of the data and hopefully some sort of predefined limits of acceptance that showed either the compare the, the results compared to each other or they do not compare to each other. And it's also a requirement within uh, five nine um, and uh, analyzing the data. that up there for a second. With proficiency tests, also um, lab is responsible for a four-year plan. We go into detail in uh, PL1 about establishing a four-year plan, what needs to be captured. So uh, other than uh, this particular uh, non-conformance, um, even if an organization is accredited uh, once in a while it pops up, they didn't do their required PT proficiency test for that year. Um, their four-year plan needs to be updated. It's the organization's uh, responsibility, and this is not just me talking. This comes right out of PL1. It, the organizations are responsibility for updating their plans before they expire, and then also if their scope changes, if they could go both ways, could be an uh, expansion or it could be a decrease uh, in the current scope. All right, uh, we have uh, here PL3. Uh, as you can see, uh, calibration, it was number six. Testing, it's number four, uh, 57. Um, PL3 is our uh, policy, PJLA's policy on measurement uncertainty. So a requirement in uh, PL3 right out of 3.1 is uh, these changes shall be documented. Additionally, for all calibration organizations, CMCs shall be recalculated based on any changes to related uncertainty budgets or underlying information contained within. This information shall be provided to the PJLA assessor during subsequent surveillance and reaccreditation. So with PL3, we require calibration organizations to submit uncertainty budgets. And at the bottom there, uh, basically, those of you that are in calibration <coughs> should be familiar with that formula. Oh, oh, there's a, it looks like they ran together there. Um, that's basically where you identify, quantify, and combine the significant contributors to measurement uncertainty. So basically, this is an example of a situation, and you can read what the finding and the objective evidence is where a particular organization wanted to increase their scope, a scope expansion. In this particular uh, instance, it was rate of rotation, probably trying to uh, get the, perhaps calibrating of centrifuges on their scopes. Um, so uh, we would require an uncertainty budget uh, in order to add that to the scope. Uh, so in this particular instance, they wanted to add it. They may have the traceability, personnel. They have the equipment. Uh, however, they did not have an uncertainty budget prepared and um, at the time that this calibration review was witnessed, hence a ninth informant was written. Um, PL3 goes into, uh, of course, uncertainty budgets, uh, goes into uh, reporting uncertainty, how to report it, and there's some detail there about uh, significant digits. You have to report uncertainty to two significant digits. You see the word CMC up there, for those of you that are in um, testing. A CMC is calibration and measurement capabilities. Um, and that's uh, another way of expressing uncertainty as the best uncertainty you can, can produce. So if you look on our uh, calibrations lab scope of accreditation, um, that CMC is depicted as the best uncertainty. So hence, by definition, an, an organization can never report an uncertainty less than what the CMC. 
So we have seen um, instances where during the course of an assessment, we look at calibration reports, but in complying with 510, our assessors should be also looking at that uncertainty and looking at the CMC. If the actual uncertainty is reported is less than the CMC, that would be a nonconformist written against PL3. Um, All right, um, moving on with uh, uh, items that appeared within the top 10 list uh, on um, 414 internal audits. That actually came up at number seven for calibration. And uh, there was 102 instances in uh, testing where this occurred. So uh, internal audits, as you, as, uh, you hopefully are aware of, is that uh, that's a vehicle for compliance. So you're looking for compliance to uh, 17025, uh, PJLA's policy guys, if you're accredited with us, and you're looking for compliance that you're actually doing what, uh, what you're stating you're doing within your quality management system. Uh, 414 states, such audits shall be carried out by training qualified personnel who are wherever resources permit, independent of the activity being audited. So uh, there's a, a little gray area there. It says where resources permit, um, which means um, in a one-person organization, resources are going to be extremely limited. And the reason behind that is you should be auditing your own work. This particular nonconformist was written uh, on in regards to the other part. If you're, it, it just specifies training. It doesn't. Uh, and looking at the requirements, the word shall. And it just specifies training. So typically with the internal auditor, I'd like to see some sort of training that they actually had in regards to 17025 uh, and internal auditing. Um, I'd like to see a record of that. And where I'm, as an assessor, and I'm just speaking for myself here, if I'm looking at an internal audit and I'm not seeing these training records and I'm seeing instances where there are obviously nonconformances that aren't being captured by these internal audits and just through dialogue, it's obvious that a clear understanding of the requirements are not being captured by the internal auditor. I'd be apt to write a nonconformance under, under this section. But ideally, you want some sort of training. And uh, I even tell uh, organizations that uh, you folks that are signed on here, um, uh, going to these uh, webinars could be a source of internal training just uh, uh, make a record of it and document it that uh, um, that uh, your PJLA's internal webinar uh, next month for example is going to be section 44 that you've had training on that section of the um, standard I'll leave it up there for a second uh, and this particular was no no record of training for any of the internal auditors conducting audits uh, and this was by uh, objective evidence was the actual in, internal audit that was looked at and by uh, done by a series of three assessors and no training record produced among the assessment team, excuse me, the audit team. Other things under internal audits is uh, basically you have to audit the entire quality management system. You have to order both the quality system and the technical system. So we're looking at uh, your internal audit should cap should cover all the elements within all the applicable elements within 17025 um, both um, technical and QMS QMS activities under section 4 um, with internal audits uh, and some of this may be up to the assessor's discretion I like to see objective evidence that was looked at I just don't it, Internal audits would like this like to see uh, more than just check marks. So that that would be another source that would prompt a nonconformance under training, perhaps. Uh, um, not uh, uh, documenting internal audits properly. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, Moving on, our top 10 list here, we have a uh, section 4.2, which uh, that is a section on the management system. You see uh, it fell in uh, number seven for testing was 32 nonconformances within calibration. 
Section 4.1 and 4.2 are areas that uh, I find if an organization, once an organization has been accredited, unless there's changes within the organization, uh, you're not, I don't typically come across nonconformances in 4.1 or 4.2. These, um, I would say, would be more prevalent during, um, more prevalent for uh, uh, new labs. So 4.2 is stated up there as a management system. Uh, management system is the, if you recall, is the area that um, talks about the quality manual, talks about the documentation of the quality management system structure, talks about the quality policy statement um, and elements that needs to be included in there. It also talks about, and this particular nonconformist was written in regards to 426. In 41, you have to uh, identify a technical and quality manager. In 426, you have to define it. Um, and you see the word shall there in the quality manual. So the requirement is the roles and responsibility of technical management and quality manager, including their responsibility for ensuring compliance with this international standard, shall be defined in the quality manual. Objective evidence uh, and a statement of finding is uh, pretty straightforward there in quality manual. Uh, where are the roles and responsibility of technical and quality managers defined? If it was not in there, um, it's not complying with four, currently with the current 17025-2005-426. Okay, uh, moving on uh, with uh, another uh, PJLA policy guide up here, which came in at number eight for, for calibration, and there was 51 instances for testing. Um, and this is our policy on measurement traceability. Um, so PL2 2.1 states, PJL requires whenever possible that said external organizations be accredited to 17025-2005 by an ILAC MRA signatory. Uh, for the calibration performed or deemed competent by an NMI in the U.S., that's NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, or recognized through the um, Mutual Recognition Agreements, MRA. So here's a particular uh, example of a finding uh, where there was a calibration um, and it was determined not to be traceable uh, because it did not meet the requirements of 2.11. Uh, this particular um, instance was a tachometer, um, and the certificate uh, uh, for that calibration uh, was from a non-accredited source. Now, um, nonconformance was written. Uh, ideally, uh, corrective action could be taken, root cause done, and you could send the instrument off to an accredited source and have it recalibrated, get an accredited type report, and um, uh, have a, have a traceable uh, standard that, at that point there. Um, PL2 goes into, uh, if you want to use a non-accredited source, uh, there's some extra hoops to jump through. So if a laboratory wants to use a, a source that's not accredited, uh, they have a little bit more legwork to do. They have to show these six elements of traceability. Uh, the main things would in, include the traceability of the standards that was used to cap, cap to calibrate your instruments. Um, the measurement uncertainty associated with that, and also that the organization had some sort of internal measurement insurance program in place, i.e., such as proficiency testing. So, um, the gist of this nonconformist was using a, uh, uh, a standard that wasn't uh, calibrated um, by a traceable source. Um, 17025 does actually make a notation in there if a calibration Bears the calibration report bears the label of an accrediting body under the mutual recognition agreement. That is considered a traceable calibration. Okay, um, four six. Uh, that's an area for purchasing services and supplies. Uh, you see it was number eight for testing and there's a total of 40 instances among calibration 
uh, labs that were assessed during that time frame. 464, the, calib the laboratory shall evaluate suppliers of consumables, of consumables, supplies, and services which affects the quality of testing and calibration and shall maintain records of these evaluation. And what's listed there is and list those approved. So uh, sources, it's always that uh, hope all of our assessors are doing this and uh, would be to pinpoint some critical suppliers looking for that evaluation, always looking at the approved vendors list and hopefully crosswalking uh, these um, suppliers of critical uh, consumables and supplies and assuring that they are actually on the um, approved vendors list. Here's an example of apparently an organization uh, used uh, a company that uh, was not on the approved vendors list. Um, and so nonconformance was read. Other things under purchasing um, uh, that's captured is uh, the actual purchasing document that's uh, generated i.e. you're going to um, generate, you're going to uh, purchase a critical service. Let's say you're going to purchase a calibration that you need for your accredited testing activity. That needs to be reviewed for, for technical content. So i.e. there's requirements in regards to the uh, purchasing documents. If you're using a purchase order, for example, it should contain sufficient detail and it should um, uh, be reviewed for technical content, ID, ideally by the uh, technical manager. Um, the other thing is uh, when these um, uh, these uh, purchase supplies come in, they have to be inspected. Uh, so, uh, and um, a record of those that uh, was inspected and approved upon receipt uh, should be maintained. Um, one thing that uh, comes to mind, uh, I'm talking about calibration, this could be a testing lab too, um, when you send a, an instrument in to be calibrated and it comes back, what needs to be inspected is the actual report. Did you get, let's say, for example, you needed the accredited report. You needed the before and after data. You needed to know whether the device was intolerant or you were using it. You needed to know the measurement uncertainty because that's a component of your uncertainty. So um, uh, that's what you intended to get when you purchased the calibration service. So when these... Uh, Certificates come in knowing that you need them, and the assessor looks at the certificate and, uh, and sees that, um, that uh, you're aware of that, and these certificates uh, lack, the, lack these elements. It's possible possibility that this could be written up under Section 4.6 Purchasing. Okay, 5-2, uh, that's personnel, the folks that are doing the... Uh, calibrations or testing and uh, testing this was uh, on the top of the top 10 it came in at number nine 34 instances um, for calibration so personnel uh, example of a non-conformance and this is something I always look for um, and I, I do come across this now and then where I'm not capturing this data competence the laboratory shall maintain records of relevant authorization, competence, education, professional qualifications, training skills, experience for all technical personnel, including contractor personnel. This information shall be readily available and include in, shall include the date in which competence is confirmed. So in other words, uh, I always uh, I specify it this way, and this I'm a calibration program manager, so I um, um, do a lot of calibration labs. So if I'm looking at a technician do a gauge block, demonstrate a gauge block calibration, and this lab might do a lot of other calibrations, might do a lot of, uh, oh, might do like mechanical, electrical, uh, various uh, dimensional type of calibration. But somewhere along the line, is to say this technician was uh, employed for about a year, he's gone through the training, um, and uh, he is now determined competent to perform calibration on behalf of this this uh, calibration lab, I'm looking for that data competence to be captured. So um, this particular nonconformance was written uh, in regards to an employee, and it actually it's for gauge blocks, that uh, um, that date was not captured. And you could capture that in many, many ways. Uh, for larger organizations, it could be ca captured in a matrix. Technicians down one side, disciplines on the other side with data competence captured. 
It'll be just a, a paper and a sign off. Employee signs off that they understand it and the laboratory supervisor, technical quality manager, somebody else signs off and uh, gives that data competence um, that they determine that employee is uh, competent to perform calibrations independently on behalf of, uh, oh, on behalf of their company. All right, uh, moving on, um, SOP3, that's our symbol procedure. See, this came in at the bottom for calibration number 10, 44 total instances for testing. Uh, symbol procedure, this is our symbol. And you see at the bottom there, that's how our symbol is to be depicted for a calibration lab. For testing, we would simply replace that word calibration for testing with your accreditation number. So there's do's and don'ts uh, uh, for using the symbol. Um, goes into detail how it needs to be depicted. Goes into the detail how to be used in conjunction with the ILAC mark. Um, we have uh, the report, the symbol may be used, and we also have a section that says may not be used. So uh, example of a non-conformance that was uh, written is uh, something that uh, in this case, a symbol was used on something that uh, was not, uh, was, is not allowed to be used on as per the requirements of SOP3. Uh, on reports, certificates or enclosed letters or letters results of the organization's scope is not accredited by BJLA. So in this particular instance, um, if you do a calibration or you do a test, it's pretty straightforward. If you're doing a test of something that's not under your scope of accreditation, you, you do not use a symbol on it. Um, this is a particular instance here, as you can see, this particular company was, um, they had this IR, which is infrared thermometry, on their accredited, they were accredited to do it. However, their range uh, did not go above 500 degrees, and it is, was reported on the certificate uh, points above the range that was on their current scope of accredit, accreditation. So just bear in mind, if you're using the symbol, you need to use it in conjunction with your accreditation activities um, on reports. You can use it with non-accredited and accredited reports. However, if there are, if there are items that are not under the scopes of accreditation that needs to be identified on the report or test that it does not fall under the organization's scope of accreditation. Okay, again, uh, moving on, uh, for one, like I said, this is, this is probably much more prevalent for um, new labs, the section four, uh, excuse me, 401, which is management requirements. Unless there have been some significant changes during the accreditation process, and let's say you have an organizational chart and uh, basically depicting the lab um, and its structure of the organization and the reporting structure, and if that's changed and that has not been updated, that might be a source for a nonconformance for an existing facility. Um, it goes into, like I said, the uh, organization of the facility. Um, this particular one was written into have policies and procedures to ensure the protection of the customer's confidential, confidential information and proprietary rights, including procedures for protecting the electronic storage and transmission of results. So it says you shall have a policy and procedure. A procedure. How do you do? How do you accomplish something? Uh, the finding was uh, all requirements of the manager, all elements of the management system um, are not addressed within XYZ's testing laboratory quality management system. So in this case, say this was a new new lab, uh, um, start the audit looking for uh, a policy and procedure for cons customer confidentiality, um, unable to produce a policy or procedure addressing customer confidentiality. Okay. Um, at uh, about five minutes before two here, I'm on the East Coast, by the way. Um, that's the end of the uh, formal presentation. And like I said, I'll provide you an opportunity to ask some questions. I'm uh, in my home base in Virginia. I have Tracy Sorensen, our president at PJLA, assisting me with today's webinar. Uh, you should have a, a spot on your um, screen there to submit any questions. Uh, she will funnel the questions to me here. 
Um, I will give uh, be quiet here. I'll give about five minutes. I'll uh, chime back in, and I'll see what the question is Ms. Sorensen um, receives, and, and it would be funneled to me, and I will uh, uh, answer as many as I can, hopefully. Um, so uh, I'll give it uh, five minutes, and uh, I'll um, sign back on then.
Okay, uh, welcome back. I'm just sorting through a few. I got a few questions here. Uh, bear with me. Um, while I'm uh, going through these, I um, want to put that up on the screen. We've uh, got the uh, next assessment. Uh, assessment, I'm sorry. Next um, webinar already scheduled for next month. And you can see the topic up there, which is Section 44 Review Request Tenders and Contracts. Um, it says scheduled for May 25th. Uh, what I hope to uh, also uh, present with this assessment as, um, uh, webinar is, uh, so you know, the standards going to be revised. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year, it looks like it's uh, going to be fairly definite. Um, look at the uh, latest committee draft and also incorporate any changes that come down uh, into the uh, system into this presentation to be either being a lookout for um, okay let's take out a few questions here question is the software included with a temperature down logger from the manufacturer has to be validated that's a proprietary and that would be fall under the realm of uh, off the shelf so no the laboratory does not have to validate that um, is an uncertainty measurement procedure still required if uncertainty is part of the ASTM standard we use? Uh, no, you don't have to have an internal procedure. Your procedure can be internal or external. Uh, I know of various uh, um, uh, uh, disciplines, NIST publications, uh, that um, actually address measurement uncertainty. Um, and uh, by all means, um, if you're basing your uncertainty on an ASTM, Method, that is perfectly acceptable. I've noticed, I'm going to read this for Tracy's benefit uh, so she can make a record of this. I, I'm sorry, Tracy, I guess you got the, you sent me the question. I have noticed that the presentation addresses common findings in uh, the U.S., Middle East, and Israel, Italy. Our lab is in the Caribbean. Well, I'd like to come to assess your lab. <laughs> um, I would like to require PJLA has so far accredited any labs in the uh, Caribbean? Thank you. Um, that I don't know the answer to, so um, I'm going to defer that to our headquarters. Um, I am. I know we have several labs in the Dominican Republic. I uh, don't know if that would be considered a Dominican uh, or not. Um, so, uh, Tracy, if you know the answer to, to that. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. Tracy, I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, I'm, bear with me, I'm reading this off our phone. My phone. Yes, we have in Bahamas, Costa Rica, and Dominican. So I can discuss this uh, further with them if you like. So um, the answer to your question, I'm sorry I didn't uh, read the, uh, Tracy did um, uh, expand on the, the question here that, uh, yes, we do have labs in the Bahamas, Costa Rica, and the Dominican. And, um, um, we can contact our headquarters, and I'm um, taking it that Tracy would be more than happy to discuss this with you. Tracy Sorensen, she's our, our uh, president operations manager, and she's assisting me from our headquarters in Troy, Michigan. So like that's all I have. So uh, I want to thank everybody for signing up for this this uh, this month's webinar. I uh, look forward to seeing uh, you all um Next month, May 25th, uh, Section 44, Review of Request Tenders and Contracts. So I uh, hope everybody has a, a real nice weekend, and uh, we'll see you next month.